Um, good evening. Um, I'm Adrian Gill. Um, and this is Stephen Vish... <laughs> That's perfect, perfect. The most unpronounceable name ever. By We're going to be having a sing-off later. Um, anyway, I'd also like to thank um, Dorbox for doing this. I do think this is a really great way of using a local bookshop. But I'm not going to say a lot about this book, except that I've just reread it again, having read it, um, like most people of my generation, when I could prop it up with my hands behind my back. And, um, and, and, and it's, 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 very, it's a dangerous thing to reread books that meant a lot to you when you were an adolescent or <coughs> when you were young, because, um, well, because they change and because you change. And, and, and I've changed and this book has changed and it's a completely new book. It's a, t I mean, a terrific, terrific book this time around. And it was, it's not the book I remember, it's a completely new book. And I, I'm bowled over by it. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. So I'm going to, uh, first of all, start off, Stephen, by saying, why did you write it? <laughs> um, it's, uh, well, that was the first uh, subject in which I realized I had something to say to North America. Because when I got to Canada, it was at the beginning a nightmare, a totally different world. And uh, I didn't speak the language, and I didn't know whether I could talk about anything uh, which uh, would interest people and who seemed to live in a totally different culture. Uh, and I did uh, edit a magazine, a kind of radical magazine, which is, was popular at universities. And uh, of course, in a very shustering uh, budget, and the kids from Mogil University came to pack the magazine to ship to various bookshops. And um, they were only a few years younger than I was. I was only 28 at the time, and uh, they talked about their girls' problems. And I said, No, 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 no you don't understand. And I started to give them advice and tell them stories, and it seems to be it seemed to interest them, and they seemed to be they could relate to and uh, <laughs> enlighten them. And so I discovered I knew something which I can tell also to a different North American audience. So that's how it started. We we perhaps should go back and 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 say how come you were in Canada. When you quite plainly don't sound like a Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I was a young playwright and one of the angry young, young men in Budapest. And um, he organized a demonstration against the regime, wanted to have Imran Adbek as prime minister, a great guy. And um, so we thought we have a demonstration, and that demonstration became a revolution. I, well, I should perhaps inject and say that's this is 1956. Yes, this is the the, the, the Hungarian rebellion revolution. Yes, that was uh, viciously put down by the Soviet. Yes, and um, the, I didn't want to leave, but I fought until the end of uh, November, and afterwards I walked, walked on the big um, uh, ring road and. Uh, I met somebody who said, are you here? I heard that uh, you already shipped to Siberia. And uh, I heard from somebody else that the police, uh, secret police was looking for me. The, the Soviet uh, army people were looking for me. <coughs> and um, so I thought, it, I, have, I better go. <laughs> and uh, so I went to, to Austria and then to Italy. That's how, that's how it and, and, and why Canada? Because that seems like two quite good ideas and then a rather duff idea. <laughs> <laughs> there, you see, I was, I, they knew about me in Italy, the Italians, to follow what happens in Hungary. I was interviewed during the revolution. I was leading a little group of students, really, and uh, young graduates. And uh, <coughs> we organized the demolition of the Stalin statue. And... Um, 
So they knew about that from the report. You're being very modest about your <laughs> role in this, aren't you? Well, no, that's not modest. We were all, we, neither of us really knew what we were doing. You, you, you were just caught up in it and you were doing it. I just demolished the statue, so I don't know what I was doing. There, it looked like a good idea. <laughs> but, uh, but I really didn't think it would get anywhere because uh, I thought we go to demolish the statue in early afternoon and I had a date for a nine o'clock movie. So I, I really thought that by that time it will be over and I can go to the movie. But uh, it wasn't over. The statue came down for at exactly at 9.30, which I made a note of because I thought that meant the beginning of the end of the Soviet Empire. And, um, and then uh, we heard the shots from the radio building where the secret police shot at students. And, uh, and then uh, one of the... Garrisons in Budapest took the sides of the, of the students and handed out arms, and, and there it was. And I got my arms from the, the head of the police, on their, a member of the Central Committee, who, who was even under the old regime, the, something like the head of Scotland Yard, Kopachi. And uh, he uh, he gave me my note that I am entitled to carry back on. Then, then I had to use them. <laughs> <laughs> I just this the book starts with the death of your father. You say a little bit about that. Well, he was a conservative, uh, uh, religious schoolmaster and church organist who also had political ambitions and uh, as head of, he was as the senior schoolmaster in that county he was also the head of the home guard uh, and um, which trained young men, it was like a little like in Switzerland you had to go if you, have, you were a young peasant boy you had to go to military training at the weekend so he was the boss of that in, in that county and um, this gave him the authority <coughs> to send out the uh, gendarmerie to dissolve uh, uh, Nazi uh, meetings in which they, the Nazis at the time still underground back in the early 1930s. Uh, to, he, he had a teacher there who, who, he, who joined this BNT uh, type party and um, <coughs> so my father always knew where to send the police to, to, to dissolve these meetings. And uh, <coughs> that uh, sort of undercover teacher got drunk and uh, told in at the Nazi wedding that how come that Wisinza, uh, my father, would know where to send the gendarmerie so they and actually he told them that it was my father who was in charge of this and so they got a young man 17 in Hungary you couldn't uh, execute anybody under 18 and they sent this guy to my father it's a complicated story but anyway he managed to get him at a desk and um, stopped him in the back there was another teacher there uh, another sort of home guard training officer. They were all, all the teachers were reserve officers. And um, they st stuck him twice in the back. Uh, that's ever since I would like to sit against the fall. <laughs> and um, I, I wasn't there, but I heard that story so often from my mother. And um, so the other teacher froze when he saw the blood coming up out of my father's back. And uh, my father went on writing. The, the chap had such a sharp knife uh, on both sides that it, it was not just like a sting. He didn't fear it. So the only thing he knew when the blood came forward on his, on his arm, and then he turned around to ask the other teachers that where this blood is coming from. And that kid stood right behind him and cu uh, cut his uh, mere artery, and that was it. And, um, and he was he was the first man to be killed by the Nazis, as far as I know, because this was back in, in, in Hungary. In Hungary, this was still in uh, 35. 
before he before Hitler came to power. Hitler was in power, but didn't have. Hitler began to have great influence in Hungary in, in the end of 35, 36. So let's go back forward now to your back in Canada. Yes. And you've written this book. Mm -hmm. And, and you published it. Yes. Everybody <coughs> rejected it. I, I got a letter from an English agent saying that he couldn't risk a reputation submitting it to a publisher. <laughs> and um, absolutely everybody rejected it, and also in America. And I got back, I sent it to the Esquire magazine for, for, for an extract, and I got it back with a huge no and an exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, but I believed in it very much. I, I thought I wrote a, a masterpiece, and uh, all, all the women I gave it to read loved it. <laughs> so I thought I must have got something right. And um, my vibe was very much against it. <laughs> and I thought I was all crazy, and... Uh, so I had a very tough three months um, because I didn't know what if they are right. Yes. And, and um, then I succeeded and then everybody told me, you know what you're doing. And of course I didn't. That's when I should have been locked up to a padded room and sold it to a crook in America. And that, that then came 10 years of war. And actually, I can thank that I, because not only I sold it to that crook world rights, I mean agents for world rights, he had it for eternity, for the end of copyright. And uh, <coughs> when my case was dismissed, he had very powerful uh, lawyers, that crook. I mean, Nixon would have never been, uh, had to leave office. <laughs> His law firm in, in New York was defending him. And... Um, <laughs> I just, I got the dismissal of my case um, the same day that I saw, I couldn't afford to live in our flat in uh, London and rented it and we lived in a little cottage in Valoris. And uh, the same day I got back, the, this, got the dismissal of the case, or uh, the front page story in the New York Herald Tribune, which you read if you were in the south of France, uh, named that judge as a mafioso. Mm -hmm. uh, by <coughs> uh, what was the, it's, uh, it's the Morgenthau who was a great U.S. district attorney for New York. He named named uh, he's still there. He must be in his 90s, but a great guy. And <coughs> he named this judge a mafioso. The same day I got this this missile. and it was a very <coughs> miserable thing to be world famous because my book was uh, a world bestseller and have to money, borrow money to eat, because these bastards just kept all the money because they went to him first. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was so bitter, I already started to write An Innocent Millionaire, and which was at the time contracted to Macmillan. And I wrote to my editor, uh, Harold Hophouse, that I'm not going to finish this book, because God forbid, it will be a full bestseller, <laughs> and, and I have to go through this nightmare again. <laughs> I don't want to, and Caroline uh, uh, showed the letter to Harold Macmillan. He was no longer prime minister and uh, old, but sometimes he came into the office. <coughs> and um, he felt, he read the letter and felt sorry for me. So I can thank to the former prime minister of Great Britain that I at least, the over a million they stole from me, I could never get it, but at least they gave back the rights. And that was thanks to Harold Macmillan. Well, that's, that's something to thank Halma Miller for, then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to go back to, to writing it, because you, you wrote it in English. You didn't yes. write it in Hungarian. No. And in fact, when the book was translated into Hungarian, you didn't translate it, did you? No, I didn't. I, I tried to improve on the Hungarian translation, but I said, this is unbecisant. <laughs> so, so they didn't translate it. How difficult it was it to write in a in in a, in a, in a learned language? Well, I I never thought I would uh, be able to do it, but it was a question of either starving or learning <laughs> uh, uh, to write in English because my tragedy was that I actually had a very um, 
privileged childhood. I, I was getting scholarships since the age of 12. My first uh, scholarship I got from Cardinal Mincenti, and from the age of 16 when George Lukács discovered me, that was, he was the Pope of uh, common, the, common, in the communist world in literature. So from thanks to George Lukács from the age of 16, from the time I left Hungary, in fact my mother still got my scholarships for a month after they were already looking for me <laughs> to arrest me. And, um, and uh, so I never knew anything except writing. So I really think writing is not so much a talent for writing as a lack of talent for anything else. <laughs> so, um, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, uh, I, when I went to Canada and when I said to people that I was a writer, I had three plays, I was the youngest thing, and they write, one won a prize, and, and what they were banned, and uh, fell in light one of my stories when I was in Italy. You know, that was the end of it. They didn't want to know about me. <laughs> and so but I you learned. Mean, I'm sorry, and I'm going to pin you down on that because you're because that you make light of that, but it is very very few people write a as well as you do, but write at all in languages that they learn as a second language in and I'm just Conrad and I'm sure there are a few others. But it, it's it's a very rare thing, and there are lots of other things you can do if you're starving. You know, and lots of other things that. Immigrants do all over the world. They don't write. They don't write novels. And I think it well, also. I really want to watch dishes. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. But 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 also you you if you get rejected in a in a foreign language, what on earth made you think they weren't right? <laughs> <laughs> because that is thanks to my mama who, since the age of five, thought I was a genius. <laughs> 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 and, uh, to whoever has children, the most important thing, to, to feel that kid or girl with self-confidence. Because that's when they need it. And if you stuff a child with self-confidence at the age of three, four, five, that will keep him in good stead for the rest of his life. That very neatly brings us to the content of the book. <laughs> because it seems to me that one of the abiding themes of, of the book, which is, is really what it says on the, uh, in the title, it's what it says on the cover, it's in praise of old women, and it's the story of a young man and his affairs with women, and is that there is, there is an abiding confidence. Is that something you recognize in yourself? Oh yes, that, to that degree it is personal. I always... Uh, it's very personal. It happened to me when I was very young, four, five, and my mother, a widow, uh, had sort of friends coming, you know, and they all smelled great and had lovely dress. <laughs> and, and, and so, well, if, if they picked me up and I could bury my face in the dress, <laughs> that felt very good. <laughs> and and uh, so, um, I always. Um, I always was attracted to the men, yes. But you were confident around women? Well, again, probably starts <laughs> with my mother, you know, that, uh, you know, I, I really thought when I was very young that I'm the most handsome and <laughs> really <laughs> handsome in the world. And also, I always avoided, it's very, I had a very life-changing experience when I was 13. Uh, I lived in a mining town, um, where our uncle took us in after the war and I went to uh, the, the big city nearby <coughs> to school. We trained, you went with a student's train every morning and I saw there a gorgeous 16 year old girl and I couldn't help but mind her and everybody laughed at me but I didn't mind and I bought her uh, candies. Every day I came with candies, and I, I was sure that after all the candy, she will, she will like me. And she just laughed at me and uh, you know, made fun of me, but I, I believe, as most people do, that deep down, deep down, he liked me. <laughs> and, and so after a couple of modes of feeding her immense amount of candy <laughs> and chocolate, I asked her when we came back, could I see you home? 
And she said very firmly, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I understood, I think that was my, my own uh, realization that I'm a genius, because from that single no, I understood if a woman doesn't like you, there is no amount of candy and chocolate. <laughs> 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 so, ever since I believed in this, so no women had to tell me twice no. You know. <laughs> and, uh, and so I believe that uh, most, uh, actually most people are not attractive to most people. And uh, the thing is to, to believe it and just stick to those well, well, there, was, there's a, there is a gratifying number who are. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, uh, from a very large selection. It's, <laughs> it's a very small presence. <laughs> um, you, you start up, the story starts off um, after your childhood in, a, in, in an American camp in Austria at the end of the war. Um, is, was that where you were? That's true, because I was in a military uh, uh, grammar school and um, the commandant of that school stole the only tr tractor they gave only sort of track which they gave to uh, the school to escape from the Russians and so I, I trudged with other kids I was a kid on the road between the German and Russian armies very educative experience all these experiences are wonderful for you if you survive them. Uh, and um, <laughs> really, I mean, all, all bad experiences are good for you. Yes. If you uh, I always uh, amazed when people tell me, oh, you had a, he had a terrible childhood or whatever. No, it was a most thrillingly uh, educative childhood. And um, there is nothing like seeing peasants uh, trying to machine on you because you are stealing potato from this field. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> it really kind of gives you a, a proper understanding of human nature. <laughs> but you, you ended up, or the character in the book, because this is a novel, I and mean, this, like, this is difficult to tell where Stephen stops and the novel starts. And the, the character in the novel ends up as, as a very young pimp for American soldiers. I didn't do that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I saw it being done. And it is true, I tried to proposition. And, 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 um, but I was 12, and uh, I, I got uh, that. Uh, I put that into the book. Uh, uh, Freilein Mozart came there for the... Uh, you know, for money, because the soldiers, the American soldiers, bought, bought girls for cigarettes and food. Mm -hmm. And since I was adopted by the commandant of this uh, American unit, I got all the cigarettes or whatever I wanted. So I offered this girl 200 cigarettes, and uh, she accepted it. So I tried to walk her. We went by a little forest, and then she was wanted to rush it. And, um, I felt very offended. I said, I don't like this kind of <laughs> sex. And one, one of the important things, and I hope it comes through the book, and that's why when people say sexy, is sex is lingering. You know, it's not the kind of fast track thing which uh, to many people... I, I know that you, that you said lingering is one of your favorite words. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's um, because... Um, that's why I'm very uh, offended when I compare it to Mrs. Robinson, because... Uh, <coughs> that's the graduate. That's the yes. graduate, <laughs> yes. The, uh, that's a brilliantly made film, brilliantly acted, but this is a, an adolescent daydream, you know, about the older women as a predator and wanting the reluctant young man, you know. And um, it's exactly the opposite way. Uh, it's very pop that is a very popular book with adolescents because they like the dream that I don't have to do anything and some women <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, so I, I never believed that and um, it, it's uh, it's a very anti-sex notion idea because um, this whole graduating this cougar thing reminds me of, of uh, General Ripper from in Doctor Strangelove, who finds the um, 
act of, of love uh, depleting. You know, he feels he loses his bodily fluids. Essence of the fluids, if you remember. Yes, I, I, I don't know if you all remember Doctor Strange Love, the, the film is the, the mad American who thinks that, that America's being ruined by the loss of uh, bodily fluids. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, probably true. To, to me, the, uh, to me uh, sex is, uh, uh, is a, an act of liberation and uh, getting stronger. Happy sex makes you stronger. Not, uh, not uh, weaker, and uh, I think the uh, the success of uh, the graduate is lies in very, uh, very fact that um, uh, sex for most people is a tiresome business, <laughs> and uh, and so that's why I never will be one of the best sellers, you know, but. Uh, so when, 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 was the, when was the book published in this country? Uh, 66. So really, that's a, 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 a pivotal time for... Yeah. Uh, yes, I was... I, it was thanks, uh, uh, thanks to Bridget Brophy and Elizabeth Smart, who, who wrote uh, without knowing me, you know, I just sent them the books and I read it and wrote about it. And uh, I got a very generous reception um, from the critics, um, Graham Greene, made phone calls for me, and uh, I, I was on a television program with uh, Robert Frost program with uh, Barbara Frost. Cartland. David Frost. David Frost, and uh, he abused me on television. Robert Frost was less talented. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And uh, so uh, uh, Actually, the reason I became a big success is thanks to Car uh, Barbara Car Cartland. He, he abused me for about half an hour, but I was young and handsome, and I just smiled, and that's day we sold out. <laughs> how, how much of the 60s do you remember? <laughs> I remember everything. <laughs> very important. Actually, writing is memory, and Nabokov was right about that. You know, uh, what makes you a writer, I think, is having good memory. You have good memory. I have a dreadful memory. No, it's not true. I read your article on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I completely forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> no, I was, going, I, I was going to ask you about this. The, do, you, do you ever reread yourself? Constantly, and uh, <laughs> before uh, this edition was published, when the went through the proofs, I I corrected four sentences. Right, because I wanted to ask you about this the, the idea of the book changing and books ch changing with your life, and it's it's I so rarely reread. It takes me such a long time to read anything that I rarely reread anything, and I was struck, as I said at the beginning of this, about how how different I felt and how different I felt about the book, and I. And, and I read it, I suppose, at the end of the 60s. Um, and it, it was a very liberating book for me. And it was at a time I remember I had my first girlfriend who was older than me. Um, and was in, had also been a friend of my mother, which is more than I ever meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> what, what you say is a very profound and significant thing, and not just about for you. My book. No, for, for, uh, about reading and readers because to read a good book only once is like listening to a great symphony once. Uh, there is no way you can um, get it, uh, everything. You're just beginning to... Any good book is much better at second reading, especially if you reread it years later, then uh, you learn a great deal more. So I always argue that instead of trying to be well informed and read everything, read, read great books over and over again. I still can um, read uh, Stendhal and I know practically by heart the uh, Charters of Parma and uh, Red and the Black. And I still can find things which I missed. You know, because great writers are very funny, you know, they, they manage to say, a great writer never writes 
a sentence which means only one thing. You know? <laughs> and and a great sentence has five, six, seven. That's eight. also true about great lawyers. <laughs> yes. It's also true at times, yes. And oh, the lawyers also. I owe a lot to lawyers because in my lawsuit against Crooked Publisher, I I learned a lot from them. I, it is from them, that's why I think Innocent Millionaire is even a bit better book, because uh, writing affidavits teaches you, you know, that the people who really read it will hate you, and they will want to use whatever you write to destroy you. So that's a very good, it's better than going into creative writings. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between uh, being an, an, an author in Middle Europe, in, 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 in Hungary, um, and in England? Uh, well, I uh, don't... Uh, well, in England uh, they used to be better appreciated, but in, in the middle of Europe, it's a great thing, when I was a kid and I said uh, to a girl that I'm a poet, you know, I was halfway there. <laughs> but, but, but when I said to a girl in Canada, I'm a poet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, they, they, they were very quickly uh, departing. <laughs> But I think you, you, we, we talked earlier, and you were, you were quite dismissive of the way that we treat intellectuals here. Yes, I mean, uh, brain work is um, everything which is difficult, people like, to, apart from sport, people like to make light of. Yes. Because if you cannot do something, that's not that important. You see? <laughs> and uh, most people think that. Yes, and we, and we agreed that this was the only country where, where people would accuse you of being too clever by heart. Yes, that's an incredible <laughs> phrase. It's an incredible phrase. <laughs> an incredible phrase. And um, yet, but I would like to, it's, um, I'm actually very hopeful because it's, it's true that only about 10% of the population thinks and other 10% all could also think if you would have better media and better schools and they would be inspired to think. But uh, the, the rest is, is just don't want, don't, don't want to think, and, uh, and there's nothing really to help them. But it doesn't matter, because even 10% is a huge percentage, because I, uh, I um, compare intelligence and knowledge about literature, which I still think the most important science, a hell of a lot, tells you more than social sciences about life and the world. And uh, that they know what is important, so their influence is far greater than the percentage. I, I compare it to algebra, algebra. It doesn't matter how few people know algebra, and, and, and that mat higher mathematics is not popular. Without it, you know, the world would come to a stop. So uh, the, it doesn't matter that the Magna Carta was under, understood by very few people. The significance of it was still Immense. Yes, I, I still read it every year. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to. I'm going to ask people to ask questions. So think of intellectually um, <laughs> showy off your questions. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to. I'm, not a very clever question, really, but it's one that's been burning me for a bit, which is. What was your best pickup line? <laughs> it was, it has to do with the eyes. You know, if you don't connect with the eyes, you know, don't bother with the pickup line. Uh, uh, the, the, the pick, you cannot, the pickup line is, is for the blind. You know. <laughs> if, if, if you see people, you have to be able to read eyes. And uh, if there is a connection, when I met my wife, um, we were meeting each other, passing each other in the corridor because we both worked at the CBC. And she denies it or she's unaware of it, but every so time she saw me, her eyes flashed, you know, with suddenly a thousand volt uh, <laughs> lamp was uh, turned on in his brain, in, in, her, in her eyes. And so after a uh, few months, 
Christmas Eve and we both worked at the CBBC because we were at home. I invited her to coffee. That was my pick-up line. That's mm -hmm. a <laughs> <laughs> but it is a <coughs> so pick-up line. Don't forget it. Uh, anybody who needs a pick-up line is, has to learn to look. Right, well, <laughs> um, who'd, like to, um, who'd like to ask a question? You, no, you, 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 ask a question. Thank right. you. I have two. One is we still don't know how to say your name. Don't, I, I, I hate my name ever since I was on a German publicity tour. There is a respect writers, and uh, I put me on the main news. Fantastic opportunity. But since it was a writer and a book, they gave you two minutes. And the Germans are very polite, and they all started out by how you pronounce your name. And by the time we got to where my name was, <laughs> two minutes was off, and I never had a chance to say anything about my book. My actual question was, about two-thirds of the way through the book, you opened a chapter by talking about the loneliness of speed, and you wrote that in the late 60s. Yes. What on earth do you make of generations who survive on text and Facebook? Mm -hmm. and I mean, no it's a tragic. There, it's it? tragic. Mm -hmm. It's tragic. And... Um, I hope they grow out of it, and actually literature is a very good way to get them out of it. And um, I try to uh, advocate reading in my own family, not always with success. And also, with all their friends, I think the most horrible thing about our society is the, the lack of uh, links between the generations. It's a terrible thing. I'm very glad that I grew up in a society where most of my friends were adults when I was a kid, and uh, I learned a lot and picked up a lot. And, uh, that's not to the way of today's youth, you know, they look down on you. And, uh, and it is to their own disadvantage. Not wanting to learn what went on before you is, uh, is not, not to know what to do in the future. I read some uh, education out, some the teachers' union made recently a statement against um, learning about the past or why learn Latin, you know, we should concentrate on the future. But you cannot know anything about the future if you don't know about the past. This idea that life started when you were born or when you were uh, able to text <laughs> is a, a ridiculous idea and very seldom strictly for the young yes. the whole youth cult is worse for the young you yes know. this is true um, another question can bad sex be as liberating as good sex in relation to Paola in the book well that's not bad sex it, it ended up well <laughs> In terms of her inhibitions towards it, then? Yeah, sorry? In her inhibitions towards sex. Well, it's not helpful, no. I don't think I show it as helpful. No. But she got over it. <laughs> uh, Is that oh, yeah, okay. So I have a question about, I, I love that idea about no being no. That's a really lovely idea. Um, in sexual relations between men and women, who has the power? Men, do men make the choices or do women <coughs> make the choices as to who goes with who, uh, based on your experience? In, in my uh, experience, I think it's not worth doing unless it's mutual. Of course. Mm -hmm. And in instances, when it, one has to make the choice and the other. I, I saved myself a lot of grief that when a, a girl said to me, or a woman said to me, I don't really know, you know. <laughs> I accepted that for a no. <laughs> <laughs> don't ever try to persuade anybody because uh, somebody researched that, that when you look at somebody you pick up thousands of pieces of information of which you are not even conscious of so if that thousands of pieces of information you give to another person and the other person gives to you by looking at each other uh, is uh, not clear you know that's it's, it's not worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. Yes? But that ignores all the women who like to be seduced. I don't believe in that. Women, uh, well, there may be, I don't know that kind of women who like to be seduced. 
I, I know only about women who are attracted to you, and, uh, and I, I was, don't know why I was never in, I think sex and love is not a game, so anybody who takes it as a game, you know, it's not, I, I don't think it's, a not, it's not an interesting person. Also, you see, if you want to be seduced, let's say if you are a woman or a man who want to be seduced, then you are, um, you need something extra beyond the attractions. You, you need some, something more than sex. You need, need a game, you need, uh, need uh, some kind of theater or whatever. Th that person is not yet there, you know. She has, she has problems with sex, whether she or he. Chap at the back. Uh, but in a sense, it's a follow-on from that question. Do you find that men read a, a, the book in a very different way to women? They're looking for different <coughs> things and maybe finding them, and it turns out that the, different, the two sexes have read an entirely different <coughs> book. Well, I find it only in, um, in uh, the Anglo-Saxon countries. In Italy, uh, <laughs> France, and Spain, and Latin America, <coughs> I couldn't tell from the review whether it's by a man or a woman. In uh, in England, in America, I could tell. You know that oh, that's that's a man's review or that's a woman's review. How can you tell? How, how, how can you tell? Well, the men tend to be more hostile. <laughs> <laughs> but not all of them. You you could you could see. You could see from the review if somebody is happy about sex, men or women, or homosexuals. I, I have many homosexual readers who love the book. I think uh, to love this book and enjoy it, you have to have a happy sex life. If your sex life is a total misery, then you will hate my book. <laughs> That's my I must remember that for all my bad reviews. <laughs> <laughs> There's millions of restaurateurs going. <laughs> Fucking the tiny dick. <laughs> um, they do that. Um, have you got a good agent before you decide? Are you going to get money from this book? Because, um, well, I hope so. I hope so. Well, I learned about contracts. You see, I had very so bad contracts. Going to, going to get money if you buy this book. Uh, well, I have a very good contract. <laughs> <laughs> But they were um, very good, and uh, Judy Moore was my agent, who, to whom I complained that nobody wants my book. And rather a friend uh, in, uh, in Edinburgh, uh, Harry Reid, who, who, who the poor man thinks I am a great writer, mm -hmm. and, and he, uh, Judy Moore was his friend, and nobody wanted to publish this book. Actually, this is the time to say that I owe it to really two men that I am here because nobody wanted to publish me um, in England and it's thanks to Christopher Sinclair Stevenson who took out an innocent millionaire after it was rejected not once but twice by uh, publishers. I spent months trying to find a publisher for it. Everybody sent the innocent millionaire back until Christopher accepted it and actually I think he accepted it the day he read the manuscript. There is a man, you see, there's so few now in, in the literary world to make up their mind, in a, read something and make up their mind. It's just like about sex, you know, that people like to think about it. And, <laughs> but Christopher could trust that his own judgment and he published uh, An Innocent Millionaire and republished in the 80s uh, in praise of older women. And if it hadn't been for that, I may not, my whole success in Europe came from that because then uh, Harry Evans went to America and published it in America and that brought the European contracts. So I really owe my, um, my existence as a writer because apart from a, a writing, being, having, being a good writer, even if you're a good writer, you need a good publisher. And the person who is really interested in literature, very few of them actually, even among <laughs> publishers. And, so, and then I found a similarly uh, committed person, uh, Adam Friedenheim, who, uh, who runs Penguin Classics. 
And again, everybody, I sent this book just a few months, uh, last year, because it was already a huge success in what's called a masterpiece around the world, from Japan to Sweden, sent it to <coughs> publishers with the reviews and closed. We didn't even get the months. Because people, you see, very few people on, can have the imagination to think something is important which wasn't in the news that day. <laughs> so they didn't read about your paper, they didn't see you on television, you don't exist. Um, has anyone else got a question they would like to, they're burning to ask? I just actually wanted to congratulate you on writing. I have to admit I've only read half the book because I was only given the book this morning. Oh. And I will finish the book by the time tomorrow. But um, it struck me as the mother of a very adult son, and it was the sort of book that every mother would give their young son because the humility <coughs> with which you accept defeat in some circumstances was so lovely. I think you said something about when I went home and cried, but then that was it and you moved on. And that's just so wonderful because when you're young, you're so vulnerable. Yes, and let me just let me just say to anyone here who is a mother with a teenage child, don't ever give them this book. <laughs> <laughs> I would it would have given, I would have completely ruined my sex life if my mother had given me this. <laughs> I, God knows, I don't want my mother thinking about my sex life. <laughs> no, she really didn't. No. <laughs> um, Okay, there was what is the, my last question. To, do you still fancy older women? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, well, that's, that's how I got married, because uh, I broke off my wife, and um, we had a fight, and she disappeared. So a very lovely 21-year-old blonde a medical student who adored me, well, I said, move in with me, because I didn't want to be alone and upset. Why do I don't need glory? I, you know, I get with this young girl. And she was very nice and, uh, and very compliant. And after a week, I went mad with boredom. <laughs> and, and so I called Gloria. I said, let's get married. <laughs> Uh, you can't get bored with her because she always argues. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good for you. Stephen, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much.